Your culture code is only as good as the degree to which you live it every day. If the head leaders are not talking about it and thinking about it every day, no one else is. I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with someone and they use the term that they feel like they were burned by HR. The company doesn't make the employee successful. The employee makes the company successful. You get more ROI when somebody's more engaged and invested in your mission and cause. We build careers, not software. Probably more than anything, people are looking for like validation. You know, you really do feel alone. Maybe we need to go earlier in the process and obsess over the experience our employees are having with our company as much or more than our customers. Hey, we're glad you're back for another episode of The Era. We want to give you a huge and heartfelt thank you for listening, and especially those who have left a review. Not only do those reviews help our message reach more listeners, they also help us provide even better content to you. As we've said before, in this podcast series, we're hoping to explore the hypothesis that organizations have now entered into the era of employee experience and how organizations can harness this era to create a top-notch organizational culture and competitive advantage. Today, we're talking about how crucial it is to make every action count in today's workplace, especially in times of unprecedented change. We all know change can slow us down and be painful for both organizations and individuals. But we also know that organizations that thrive are those that recognize change as an opportunity to improve. At Bamboo HR, one of our teams has a motto that they use to help them embrace change. They say, we eat change for breakfast. I'm not sure what change actually tastes like, but I appreciate that they plan to not let change get in the way of their daily success. Some questions we'll be asking in today's episode. Is it possible to have a successful career and do meaningful work? How can organizations do more than just make aspirational statements about social issues and instead make impactful and lasting changes? And finally, when times get tough, what is the glue that holds some organizations together while others fall apart? To help us answer these questions, first, we'll talk to Nivi Achanta about her journey to find more meaningful work. Next, employment attorney Mark Kluger will join us to discuss navigating workplace disruptions. And finally, we'll hear from SurveyMonkey's chief people and places officer, Becky Cantieri about how her company has built a culture that can withstand even the toughest challenges and changes. Part one, forces of change. I didn't really consider myself to be passionate about many things. And then right before graduation, I just discovered the world of sustainability and social impact. And I was like, okay, this is what I wanna do. Meet Nivia Chanta, CEO and founder of the Soapbox Project. Before starting her own company, she was a rising star at a multinational consulting firm. And like many others her age entering the workforce, she found herself passionate about doing good both inside and outside the office. I interviewed with Accenture and I distinctly remember that like the two things that I really, really enjoyed is first, the, the talk about how, you know, every day might bring a different problem and you get to work with all these different clients and solve all these problems. I was like, great. I like to do that. I like to not be bored. And then the second thing that really drew me in is they really uh, played up their, their social impact opportunities. And they were talking about all the ways you could volunteer, all the ways you could even take time off of your regular consulting work and do pro bono consulting work in other countries. And I was like, okay, this is a, this is a great corporate playground for me to continue finding ways to make an impact while also getting quote unquote real world skills and building up, you know, my, my data science skill set, my analytics, my how to talk to fancy rich people and things. So I, I thought that it was the, the perfect job. So fresh out of college, Nivy went to work, and just as she was promised when interviewing, she was able to find ways to make a big impact. She started fighting wildfires. In 2018, I actually launched my own project at Accenture, and it was right after or during, actually, the 2018 Paradise Wildfires in Northern California, 
And I realized that there were so many employees that were between projects just waiting to be mobilized, but there wasn't really any infrastructure. So I ended up getting a team off the ground and we went to Paradise and we volunteered there and we helped, you know, just do like day-to-day volunteering. We helped set up their tech. We went over their volunteer intake forms, just generally applied our skills to that disaster. And I realized like even even in a for-profit world, we need to rally this kind of disaster management in a much better way. That experience just made me realize how broken it was. So from 2018 to 2020, I was just asking, I just want like a few hours a week or a month to just dedicate myself to this project. And it's not only going to help me, it's going to help the company. And it was great. Nivi was excited. She was putting her skills to work on assigned projects and had found a passion project where she could also make a big difference. It seemed as if everything was working well for Nivi, her like-minded coworkers, and her employer. Something really interesting about my experience is if you were at Accenture with me, you would have thought I was like doing really well in my career and like doing all the right things because I got a chance to speak with the CEO and I was easily the youngest person to have that opportunity at the time. And so I was doing all these things that I thought were good, I thought were productive. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't count in your performance review or if it is not structurally recognized, then like even after all the photo ops and the fancy stuff, it doesn't mean anything. And that's where Nivi started experiencing the disconnect. She was invested in the corporate activism part of her job, but started to find that that portion of her job, the part she'd been sold on in her recruiting, wasn't rewarded or taken into account in her evaluations as an employee. Lack of alignment is a huge issue for a lot of organizations and employees, and not just on the issues of activism or community service. Anytime an employer or an employee has an unmet expectation, there is potential for harmful dissatisfaction. I have found that it doesn't matter the size of an organization from a two-person startup to a massive multinational corporation. Building and maintaining alignment on the jobs to be done is one of the hardest things to do consistently. Communication, constant communication becomes paramount. Literally every person that I talked to in my same career range and age group had a similar experience to me. And so I would consider myself to be maybe more socially impact minded than other people. Like everyone has different career goals. And even for the people that really came in to make money and learn new skills, it still felt like we were all experiencing the same disconnect of I thought I was going to do this one thing in my job and I'm doing something else. And so I think really it's it's this idea of like when we were being recruited, I think we all got the same idea of like facing new problems every day and even having the opportunity to make an impact and all of these different things. And really what, I don't know how this applies to other industries, but in consulting, like it is very driven by profit and I get that. Um, but it felt that we weren't even having basic space to have our needs articulated. For me, that was social impact opportunities. But for other people, it was like they wanted to build specific skill sets, whether that's data analysis or, you know, learning design and stuff. And when you're brought into consulting, they tell you, oh, you'll be able to learn whatever you want. And so I, I, I can't exactly articulate why, but I will tell you like, I talked to over a hundred people at least easily during my three years there and everyone that was in my same age category, you know, had graduated within the past one or two years. Every single person that I talked to had the same version of the story of, I thought I signed up for this one thing and I'm not really getting it. And something else interesting is that none of these sentiments were really getting escalated to executives because it's a very touchy subject. So a few problems here. First, Nivy and her coworkers found some big misalignment between the work they thought they'd do and what they actually do. Then second, and probably more critical, was that there was no channel for communicating this misalignment up the chain of command. Whether it's something big like role requirements or something small like whether or not cameras should be on during meetings while working from home, communication around expectations is so key to employee and employer satisfaction. When we work together and are open to changing with each other, more often than not, we're able to find shared alignment. In the end, Nivea and Accenture ended up parting ways in August of 2020, during a round of layoffs. In that process, Nivea wrote a letter highlighting both her appreciations 
and recommendations for improvement at Accenture. When I left the company, I published my farewell letter and it ended up going kind of viral on a few consulting social media. I don't know if you've heard of Fishbowl, but that's one of them. Some people were really supportive and because it's an anonymous platform, a lot of people were pretty vicious. And one thing that they were saying is, oh, does this person not understand the point of the company is to make money? And I get it. And all of the conversations that I had with executives, with my managers, they were never like, hey, I mean, maybe some of them were like, I want to work full time on this social impact thing. But I felt that I was being pretty realistic of saying, I am happy to learn, you know, these larger scale client projects that don't have anything to do with social impact. But in order for me to have that energy, I also want the things that I'm doing on the side to be supported. Nivy certainly isn't the only employee of any generation looking for more support from her employer and purpose in their work. I am seeing the same pattern of how do I find purpose in my work? I'm seeing that pretty universally. And, you know, I, I try to talk to at least five to 10 users every week. And so I, I talk to a lot of people and even people in their dream jobs have some equivalent of this. And I don't think it necessarily has to be as bad or as hard to navigate. For example, I have a friend that works at Google. And as you might know, recently, Google has been doing some very insidious ethics stuff. And, you know, they, they're just having a lot of internal problems. And she has basically her dream job at Google and she loves it. But at the same time, there's this conflict of my company represents me. I represent my company in some way. It's part of my identity. So what does it mean to have to navigate this balance of like having a job that I love, but still feeling like it's murky? So I think I think it happens in various degrees of some people feeling like totally disconnected from their goals and what they came in to do. And for some people, it's less of a tricky point because they are getting a lot of what they what they wanted to do in their jobs. But I have seen it universally. I think I'm seeing it less at smaller startups where my friends and other millennials, where they're able to define the culture instead of just come in and absorb an existing culture. But almost every, I will actually, every single person that I've talked to working at like a large company echoes a similar sentiment. Employees are craving the opportunity to make it count. I find it so interesting that Nivi mentions that her friends at smaller companies seem to be more fulfilled because they're able to influence their company's culture. As we grow from small companies to larger or more established ones, we must preserve important aspects just like this. I believe the best companies, no matter their size, find a way to engage their employees to continue to build. It might be building new and impactful products. It might be building culture. In fact, at Bamboo, we've tried to strike the words like culture fit and preserving our culture from our vocabulary as we grow. These words make it seem to new Bambooligans who are joining today that they have nothing to add to our culture or our company. That's not true. We want to build and grow together. We need our language to reflect that. Certainly, some things have to change as our organizations mature. But the ability for every employee to have an influence, to build, to add to an organization should remain. This is also a great example of why it is so important for HR and business leaders to have open lines of communication with employees. It's so crucial that we don't look away when many of our employees are telling us that they value something or they see something. Yes, change can feel overwhelming. But employees are our partners, and we need to find a way to align and benefit together. It can seem that millennial or zillennial employees are looking for perfection in their employers, but I'm pretty confident in saying that we're more looking for accountability and transparency and a commitment to doing better. Especially after last June, we saw a lot of companies putting out these bold statements being like, you know, Black Lives Matter and we support them. And on the other hand, you had companies that were sharing their internal statistics and they weren't, you know, they weren't great, but they shared, you know, how exactly they would make them better, how they would go from 20% women in management to 50% or, you know, 1% black employees to 13% or whatever the, whatever the targets were. And, you know, I have friends that, that work at the companies that actually set the goals and did the work. And, and really it, it comes from, internal transparency, internal goal setting, and HR, is, you can't do it without that. Part two, innovating through disruption.
Millennials really have driven that um, because they're not afraid to say what they think. And they're also powerful enough as both consumers as well as employees to say, this is the way it's going to be here or we're going to look for work elsewhere. This is Mark Kluger, a New Jersey-based attorney with over a decade of experience working in labor and employment law. While equity has certainly been a topic of discussion for corporations for years, organizations are now facing more pressure than ever from both employees and customers to take a stand and make real changes for the better. Something that I see is almost a continuation of the culture we started seeing Um, with the Me Too movement. What I mean by that is that was sort of the first time when the Me Too movement really got going that we saw um, employers responding to both internal pressure from their employees as well as external pressure from consumers to take positions. And those positions that we started seeing them take were primarily terminations of CEOs who were accused of sexual harassment or other executives that were done in a public way. You know, if it, and it's sort of hard to remember, but before the Me Too movement, an employer who was accused of sexual harassment, a senior executive, a high profile person, pretty much would disappear into the woodwork. In other words, they wouldn't necessarily be publicly executed. In fact, they may have stayed on for years, as we saw in some of the large media companies without naming names, where, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of accusations, a lot of lawsuits, a lot of litigation, a lot of settlements where nobody ever lost their job. And the reason that changed was in part because social media, unlike the regular media, where an an employer could sort of wait out the news cycle, social media put this in the face of the public as long as the public wanted to know about it and hear about it. And so employers started reacting to pressure from their employees to say, this isn't an acceptable culture, people, you know, heads need to roll. But also, I would say even more so from consumers who said, we're not going to you know, buy your products. We're not going to watch your shows. We're not going to go to your movies unless you change your culture. And that has resulted in employers, um, CEOs, taking public positions on social issues as well as uh, political issues. So as we heard from Nivi earlier, and as Mark has seen from a corporate law perspective, millennials and younger generations expect more out of the organizations they choose to work for. An issue we run into often, though, is that so many organizations give these ideals lip service and nothing more. Well, I think it's great that companies are taking positions and making statements and donating money. I am somewhat afraid that once the noise dies down, we're not going to have made an awful lot of progress. The realities of making a difference in our organizations and hopefully on our communities as a whole are a lot more nuanced than simply stating our ideals. We have to do things that truly matter. One of the big pushes we're seeing is for more diverse, equal, and inclusive hiring practices. But this is easier said than done. I'm not going to name names because I can't remember, but there was one company that made a pledge to increase its uh, senior management uh, by a certain percentage of minority candidates. And I drilled down, I was really curious because it was like a pretty big promise. And I drilled down into the numbers. I think it was like a 25% increase by next year, something like that. And I drilled down into the numbers, uh, how many minority uh, senior executives they had at the time and how many total executives they had. And it ended up being like they were going to, they, they essentially pledged to hire like three people over the next five years. I mean, it was just, it sounded great, you know, because it was a big percentage boost, but it was really minimal in terms of actual bodies in the seats. When it becomes clear that changes need to be made in our organizations, I think we should step back and really consider who are we making statements and changes for? Is it for the media, our reputation, or should it be for our employees, especially those who are particularly impacted by these issues? What matters most isn't that we are seen taking a stand, it's that we take a stand and make it count in meaningful and genuine ways. It's unnatural to force it. I think it does have to come. uh, It certainly has to come from the top, but it has to be genuine. It has to be sincere, but it also has to be careful. In other words, when companies say that we're going to, uh, we're going to hire X percentage of minorities into this category of employee and X percentage of minorities into that category of employees, essentially what they're saying is that they are going to take race into account in hiring. 
from a legal perspective, you're not allowed to take race into account in hiring. So it's, you know, it, it, it is in some ways completely in conflict with employment law to say by next year, among our 50 managers, we're going to have 30 minority candidates. Well, what are you saying? Okay, we're, we're just going to start hiring minorities. And that really isn't genuine either. And it's ultimately bound to fail if it's just done to get numbers in the door and say, we hit our quota. So there does have to be a more organic approach. And there does have to be a real education among hiring managers to understand what it means to grow a diverse workforce. And it is going to take time. I think if the commitment is genuine and, it's, and it is sustained over time, as opposed to being just sort of the issue du jour, um, it can work. But there really has to be a plan and it really has to be carefully executed and over the long term. And I think we've all seen how issues become hot for a period of time and then they get dropped. Especially in issues that matter so much like diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to ensure that our solutions aren't reactionary. They must be strategic and built for sustainable lasting improvements. It's also critical that we follow through on these commitments to change. As we'll talk more about later, delivering consistently is the only way to build trust inside your organization. Another area we need to focus our attention is on our return to work plans following the COVID-19 outbreak. There's really no doubt that the negative employment impacts of the pandemic have been more painful for women in the workplace than men. And while there are certainly societal implications of this fact that we should heavily analyze, the issue in front of us now is how to make it feasible for working parents to come back to work at all. There's no question uh, that the way in which this has played out has affected women in the workplace far greater uh, than men. And that really does stem from the schooling issue. Typically, the primary caretaker of children, uh, regardless of, you know, whether there are two working uh, parents, uh, women seem to have, you know, left the workforce in far greater numbers and are not returning to the workforce in far greater numbers since we started seeing toward the end of the summer as, you know, unemployment started turning, uh, women were not coming back in. And that has a lot to do with the fact that schools in many instances around the country are hybrid. So kids are maybe in in-person school two or three days a week in home uh, doing remote learning other days. And so uh, better or worse, it just has had this impact. So one of the things that employers have to look at is uh, more flexibility in terms of workplace policies and ways in which to incorporate women back into the workforce in ways that work. And part of that could be think, looking at things like maybe having different shifts if possible. In other words, I think we've all learned a great lesson in flexibility uh, throughout the last you know 12 months. And one of the things that employers have to look at is not only you know having a more remote workforce, which was forced upon everybody and much to the surprise of employers who said that would never work for them. There are also things that um, they can possibly do in terms of adjusting hours. You know, I think we've also realized that people don't necessarily have to work nine to five in order to be productive. And so if somebody can start working at three and work with a group of other people who are starting their workday at three, maybe when there's, you know, when, when remote school is over or, you know, flipping the schedules around so that a second parent is home and the other parent can start working on different hours. At the time we're recording this podcast, I feel like we're just starting to see the light at the end of this COVID-19 tunnel. And even when this current pandemic ends, we'll have to keep being careful and deliberate in all of our decisions and policies so we can create the best employee experience possible, even as we face tough challenges and changes. Part three, culture of trust. Whether it's an economic downturn, a pandemic, or really anything in between, there's no doubt that times can quickly turn tough on organizations for many reasons. But there's also a reason there are so many maxims and anecdotes about strength coming out of struggle. This concept is one that's very relevant and understood by Becky Cantieri, the Chief People and Places Officer at SurveyMonkey. My title is Chief People and Places Officer because we think about the facilities 
even though we're not in the facilities today as part of the experience. And it is our part of our, you know, arsenal of things that we use to help attract and retain really great talent. SurveyMonkey isn't the only organization that has made their place or office a central aspect of culture. With the abrupt transition to remote work, many HR and business leaders have lost the workplace as one tool in the culture toolbox. For SurveyMonkey, uh, prior to COVID, it served as not only the place that we went to do all of our productive work, the majority of our workforce was in the office five days a week. And now we're really thinking about isolating it to collaboration, community, and learning. And then for there to be choice where you do your individual productive work. For many, that will be going back home or to their home office to do their individual productive work. And for those who don't have a comfortable place at home to work, they may decide to remain. But that's where the choice concept, which is really the concept that we see as the vision for work will come into play. Going remote hasn't only changed SurveyMonkey's vision and purpose for their physical workspace. They've also had to completely pivot the way they recruit, something I'm sure many of you can relate to. Like most, we had to pivot really, really quickly to an entirely virtual recruiting experience. The SurveyMonkey team worked hard to make this transition smoother than it might have been otherwise while also inserting some really important changes to their recruiting process. I think the most fundamental changes, ironically, that we made in 2020 were a lot less about doing it virtually as it was about the emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The most influential practices that we put into place were um, we do diversity sprints for all hires, director, and above. We hired a dedicated sourcing team that helps us source candidates. And despite the headwinds, it's been our most productive year towards our publicly stated diversity, equity, and inclusion goals that we've ever had. And it's been within the constraint of a virtual environment. So what is that secret sauce that allows some organizations to really make it count and thrive even during and despite tough times? For Becky and SurveyMonkey, the answer is practice resilience and establish trust through change. Having been at SurveyMonkey for more than nine years, Becky has been there through pretty much all the transitions and transformations, or as she calls them, chapters. Wow, it has been a chapter book, absolutely, is I think the way to describe it. You know, the first three or four years we were in build mode. Uh, when Dave joined as CEO, SurveyMonkey was 14 people in Portland, wow. Oregon. It had really no leadership team. The founder and his brother, as part of the transaction, exited and Dave joined. And then he sought out to build a leadership team and really work to take advantage of the opportunities that were in front of SurveyMonkey. So yeah, phase one was really about driving growth and expansion, not only of the team, but also of the business itself, expanding internationally, but still very, very focused on the self-service business. As you know, SurveyMonkey is a SaaS business, a self-service, it began as a self-service SaaS business. So that was really chapter one. This building phase is one that we see so many small and medium-sized businesses in. And it's a phase that is so crucial for setting the stage for success down the road, especially for people in a leadership or HR role in those early days. I got some great advice when I started in the role too that was really helpful to me. And that was, you gotta think of it as kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The most important thing when you first start out is scaling and growing the team. So you almost spend your first year or two figuring out how to hire at scale, onboard and make productive at scale, you know, all of the members of your team. And then you need to start to build out your internal infrastructure, your HRIS, your applicant tracking system, all of those infrastructure tools that will support your growth along the way. You don't get to some of the higher order things like learning and development, right? Or some you know, investment in growth until uh, you kind of reach the point where you've got your recruiting and talent acquisition machine really, really humming. And then you can start to move on to um, some of those higher order things. So I would say, get your recruiting machine up and running, 
make sure you think about your HR technology infrastructure and data early so that you don't have to go back and retrofit along the way. And then culture starts from the very, very beginning. You set, you start to set the tone when you've got two people in the building. And as you build, you have to be thoughtful, deliberate, and open-minded about the evolution of your culture over time if you want it to be a competitive advantage for you. So SurveyMonkey set a strong foundation. They were deliberate about things that matter like culture right from the start. And like most things with business and really just life in general, once they got to a comfortable place, things changed. Chapter two was about the expansion into the enterprise and selling the SurveyMonkey platform into businesses for more purpose-built solutions that meet the needs of businesses. So that's kind of been the evolution or the transformation of the business. Through that, we've done CX, employee engagement, market research, and kind of expanded the portfolio of purpose-built solutions that SurveyMonkey has for its customers. But before Chapter 2 closed for SurveyMonkey, things were about to change even more in an unexpected and tragic way. Dave Goldberg passed away unexpectedly in May of 2015, which was quite a shock to the system of SurveyMonkey. So that made for a, you know, a difficult period of transition and building resilience um, as an organization and getting through a really, really tough experience. And through that painful trial, SurveyMonkey was able to learn an absolutely priceless lesson. I hope other organizations don't have to, you know, learn the same lesson the way that we learned the lesson. I think the mo- the simplest way to put it is as an organization, you have to be able to get through hard things. Sometimes your hard things are a pivot in your business strategy. Sometimes your hard things are talent related, but at its very core, it's being able to authentically manage through a really difficult situation and come out the other end stronger than you were going in. And I think that's exactly what happened when we lost Dave that year. There wasn't a playbook for that experience, despite the fact that as leaders, we all reached out to our mentors, our network and said, what do we do? Everybody came back and said, I'm not sure, like, I don't have a playbook to help you, you guys. So we, as a leadership team, we kind of locked arms and said, okay, we've got to get through this. We've got to get the team through it. We're going to be really authentic. We're going to let everybody be really sad because there's, there's no other emotion that we can lean on right now, except for shared grief. So we're going to go through this shared grief experience. We're not going to tell everybody to stay focused and get back to work. They're not capable of doing that right now. They're really sad and they're really upset. So we kind of just let everybody as a team grieve together. We had the great shared experience of being able to go to his memorial service, which I think was really cathartic for the team. So the SurveyMonkey team banded together and earned resilience, really through probably the hardest path possible, losing a beloved leader and friend. And during this experience, they formed a new mantra that encouraged them to make the most of every day. As people came together, it's really interesting. This, I don't know who started it. It was an, I believe it was an engineer. They created this hashtag make Dave proud. And then that just kind of rose up as this rallying cry to bring everybody together. And not everybody was at the same place at the same time to kind of be like, the show will go on and we will do it for him. We will carry out his legacy. We will head towards his vision. We won't miss a beat, and we're going to do it for Dave. This is so powerful. The idea that SurveyMonkey's leadership team knew resilience was important, but they had no idea how and when that resilience would be put to the test. At Bamboo HR, we're big believers that things we learn at work can make us better on our personal lives and vice versa. And with everything we're facing right now, this truth has never been more relevant than it is today. In fact, I'm a big believer in the principle introduced in Clayton Christensen's book, How to Measure Your Life. That business can be a noble profession if you focus on the individual, the human. How can you help them be better at work, which then spills over to their personal lives and helps them be better in their families and their communities? 
I'm so inspired by the idea we can change the world for the better by how we choose to do our business. These small distinctions at work add so much humanity to an organization and it makes all the difference. So I think the most important thread of the SurveyMonkey culture that remained persistent in the good old days and does still today, which was really the thing that we could rely on. And I remember it so distinctly, even from my interview with Dave Goldberg, is he because he believed wholeheartedly we could build a really successful business. And he used the language, but we can care deeply about people. So that has been the really persistent thread is no matter what, we're going to care deeply about people and that we're going to use that as our North Star when we think about how we recruit, when we think about building our mission, vision and values, when we respond, when difficult things happen that relate to people, we're going to care deeply about people. For SurveyMonkey, this experience of getting through a loss together as well as their continued focus on people, undoubtedly prepared them for challenges like COVID. And before that, changes like a new CEO or an IPO, both crucial moments in their third chapter. It was like, we can get through this hard thing. And then the next thing you know, you're six months out, you're a year out. And it's that strength of team, that strength of relationship that gets you to the other side of the equation. And it's definitely something we relied upon again in 2020 to help us get through. We're going to get through it together. We know we're going to do hard things. We're going to be here to support one another, and we're going to be authentic to the experience we're having. We're going to be open and uh, direct with one another when we say this sucks, because some days it sucks. You know, I absolutely love this insight from Becky. Sometimes things can feel so dark and impossible to trudge through alone. I'm sure a lot of your employees felt that last year or perhaps even still. I know for me, there were some hard personal moments in 2020 that delivered some sweet experiences as well. 2020 started with the loss of my 96 year old grandmother. She's the matriarch of the family, 23 grandkids, 85 great grandkids. And she left behind her 98 year old husband. We as a family rallied around him and tried to protect him from COVID and take care of him throughout 2020. He ended up getting COVID and we had some scary moments as he was in the emergency room. He ultimately came home, but he needed more help from the family. And it was amazing experience for me to spend some days with him working from his house rather than my own home and helping him do some of those daily tasks. And what I found was the relationships that we have in our lives with our family, with our colleagues, with our community and our ability to lean on each other that helps us put one foot in front of the other. We do that until we can look in our rear view mirror and recognize that's what got us through. A global pandemic, a tragic loss of a CEO. Those are certainly unexpected situations that will test an organization's resilience. But what about growth and success? In September of 2018, SurveyMonkey went through an IPO. Becky believes there's some consistency in how they managed through that change as well. You go public and then you have to report earnings to the street and your level of transparency and what you can say and when you can say it changes dramatically. You have things like SOX compliance and all of this, you know, these requirements as a public company that can really change the perception of you as an organization. They feel they can feel very bureaucratic. They can feel like you're no longer transparent. But if you have, we had this thread of we cared deeply about people, it was still reflected in our programs, our choices, how we engaged with the team. And it gave us, uh, it allowed us the ability to change some of the dials on how we operated, our operating cadence, our operating mechanisms. And they still believed we had their best interests in heart at heart. We just had to say, our level of transparency has to change a bit and here's why. But because we had built trust over time and they had seen the pattern of we say we're going to do something and we do it, we had that to carry us through. And again, it, it, it still is the core, found one of the core foundational pieces to our culture is they know that we care deeply about them. We make choices that we believe are in their 
best interests while we continue to scale and grow and mature as a company. We helped bring a lot of people along and you can see it in our retention of talent too, um, because we kept their favorite part of the culture consistent over time while still adapting and scaling and growing, which was required of us as a public company. Culture isn't static. It does evolve. It grows. But the things that are most important, what we value as a company, can stay consistent. Because it gives people something to anchor to. And in our case, it was it was the values and some of our rituals. Uh, and even uh, in our case, although it wasn't as intentional, we had this hero who was Dave Goldberg and now has become Xander Lurie, who uh, act as the figurehead in, in many of our stories and our experiences day to day. Looking back over the chapters of both the tough and exciting experiences SurveyMonkey has encountered over the past nine years, it's clear what made it possible for them to persevere, trust. But trust is hard earned and can't be established overnight. It seems that in order to retain trust through tough times, organizations need to consistently build that trust when times are good. I think it goes back to the, the resilience and trust that you build with the team over time, which is one of the best side effects, you might call it, of ongoing engagement with employees, whether you do it through a survey or direct interaction, is I think it establishes this uh, relationship and this credibility. We listen, we care, we tell you what we hear, and we tell you what we're going to do with what we heard. And sometimes we tell you, we heard what you said, but it's not the right thing for us to do. And here's why. And you kind of do it over and over and over and over again. And it builds trust. That way, when you come to a leadership change, a change of greater magnitude in your medical, dental, or vision, or you know, some other, you're coming on to an acquisition or something like that, it, you have this credibility and this history and this pattern to rely on um, and employees trust that you're going to navigate through it well. You're going to be open and transparent to the degree that you can. And that, again, you're leaning on this thread of we care deeply about people all the way through. And they, you know, believe what you say when you when you do it over and over again. And it helps you get through those more difficult moments. So it seems that no matter where you are in your career or where your organization is in its evolution, tough times will come. While we should absolutely appreciate the highs, it's more important that we are always prepared for the inevitable, challenges and changes. What's more, when we embrace these changes, our organizations become stronger and better for it. Thanks for joining us in this episode of The Era. We are so thrilled to see that so many of you are invested in exploring the employee experience with us. Again, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts and email us at podcast at bamboohr.com if you have any topics you'd love to hear. We're all ears. Before we go, I want to thank Nivia Chanta for teaching us that when we embrace the opportunity to re-envision work to make it more meaningful, we can light a fire in employees of all generations and have a greater impact on our community. To join Nivi and start making a difference in your community, visit soapboxproject.org. A huge thanks to Mark Kluger for sharing his wealth of knowledge and experience in employment law with us. If you're in the New York or New Jersey area, find him at klugerhealy.com. And last but certainly not least, thank you to Becky Cantieri for sharing her very personal and sage wisdom with us. If you haven't checked out SurveyMonkey's Culture Code, Stop whatever you're doing and go read it. And of course, check out SurveyMonkey to see how they can help you gather insights both inside and outside your organization. We've been using them for years and it's a phenomenal company. In our next episode, we'll chat with more HR and business pros about how being open and assuming the best aid in their employee experience. Until next time, thank you for joining us on The Era.